Welcome everybody. My name is Saskia Hiltemann and today I will guide you through the 16S rRNA sequencing with Mother tutorial on Galaxy. So this tutorial is in the metagenomics section of the GTN. Um, as you'll see there are two versions of this tutorial, so the, both versions are exactly the same, uh, except the extended tutorial goes through every step uh, manually, all the tools, and the short version uh, consists of a series of uh, workflows that you run um, which do the exact same, all the same tools except uh, it's a little bit faster to click through and you can focus more on the um, underlying concepts. So today we will do the uh, short tutorial um, but at the start of every section um, it is possible for you to switch to the extended version um, if you would like more information about um, that section. So here you see beneath every section, switch to the extended tutorial if you want to go through every tool step by step, or you can switch to the short one if you just want to run the workflow and then um, examine the outputs from there. Okay, so in this tutorial we will um, follow the standard operating procedure, SOP, um, for MySeq data as it was developed by the creators of the Mother tool package and the Schloss lab. Um, so the Mother tool package is the analysis tools we are going to use. Um, what we will do, what we will cover in this tutorial, first we will um, get our data into Galaxy of course, um, we will create a uh, because we have multiple samples we will create a collection to make things a little bit easier in Galaxy to handle so we don't have to run the every tool um, for every input data set. We'll make a collection so we only have to run the tool or workflow once for the entire um, set of sample. Then the first step like always is the quality control. We want to make sure we have high quality data. So we'll uh, filter and trim our data and uh, clean it in other ways. Then we will uh, do some sequence alignment and then we will uh, assign taxonomies to uh, our sequences. Um, there is an optional step here to uh, calculate error rates based on our mock community. So often to assess how well this whole process both of sequencing and of the in silico analysis works. Um, you can set sequence a mock sample so you create an artificial sample uh, with known quantities of known um, microorganisms in it and um, ideally you would like to find exactly uh, back what you put in and if you find other things you know there might be some contamination somewhere in your process or if you find them at um, the wrong rates you know there might be some bias um, so you can use this to assess the error rate of your whole process um, we will do uh, OTU clustering and some diversity analysis and then finally some visualizations. Yeah, there's some uh, some more information here about the 16S ribosomal RNA gene um, that I covered in the slides also. But we use this gene um, because it is highly conserved across bacteria so we can um, easily target it and we can use the variable regions that this gene contains to differentiate between different genes. Uh, in our sample. So the data we will use for this tutorial is also generated by the Slosh Lab, the creators of um, the Mother Toolset. So what they did was they had a very big experiment. They followed a, a large set of mice for um, one year, every day sampling their feces and sequencing it. And for the first 150 days they just let these mice um, grow naturally and they wanted to assess sort of the, um, the natural variation in microbiomes between these mice. So this is 150 time points, so this is quite a lot of data. Uh, too much for this tutorial, it would take too long. So for this tutorial we just take the first 10 time points and the last 10 of the 150 day period for one of the mice and then we compare those two. Now a quick note about the data set naming scheme. So you will find um, we will be using a bunch of samples named like this. So it starts with F3D0 
In this case, this means a female mouse number three on day zero. And every sample, since we're doing paired end sequencing here, every sample consists of um, two files, two FASTQ files, which are identical in name except for this R1 for the forward reads and R2 for the reverse reads. Okay, so with that, let's start importing our data into Galaxy. So before we start with our analysis, let's make sure we have a new history. So if uh, your history is not empty, please click the plus icon here at the top to start a new history and give it a name you can remember. So something like 16 s r r n a mother and hit enter to make it stick. So like I said, we are going to take uh, 20 samples, 10 early time points and 10 late time points. Um, these are paired end sequences, so there are two files per sample. So in total we have 40 files. Now there are two ways to get your data. Um, there are links in the tutorial manual to from Sonodo, so you could copy all of these and upload them by the upload button as you've done before. Or many of these tutorials um, on the Big Galaxy servers also have the data in a shared data library, so I will demonstrate that method. Um, but if this is not available on the Galaxy you're on, please uh, upload them via the URLs. But to get to the shared data libraries at the top of our galaxy here, we will go to shared data, data libraries, and this will look a little bit different depending on which um, server you're on, but you should see this gtn-material data library. If we click on that, we see here it's organized in the same way as the uh, tutorials are themselves. So here you have the different topics, and we will scroll down to metagenomics, click on that, and then we see here uh, at the top for me it's 16S microbial analysis with mother. Click on that, you see there are different uh, versions, so we've updated the tutorial ones, but let's just go with um, the highest number here. And here we are just going to import everything, so you can see here we have a bunch of uh, FASTQ files uh, as expected. So let's just at the top here select everything and then at the top there is this button export to history. Um, there are two options as data sets as a collection. Let's uh, export them as data sets first and then we'll um, make the collection uh, later. If you click that it'll ask you which history to import it to so you can just do it to a current one and hit import. So the nice things about using data from the shared data library is that it doesn't count against your quota. So it's sort of free data. So if, it, if it's here, uh, I would suggest using it. It's also faster than uh, uploading from URL again, and it saves space on the server um, that not everybody's duplicating their data sets. So once you saw the green checkbox, uh, the green box indicating everything went all right, let's go back to our uh, main, to our home page by clicking on analyze data. Okay, now we see here we have 46 files in our history. So we have 40 files that are our FASTQ samples. Um, and you see we also have some extra um, data sets and these are reference data sets we will use later on in the tutorial. Now the first step we want to do is to organize all our um, sample data, our FASTQ files, into a collection so that we can run everything once on the entire collection and save us a lot of clicking. So to do that, we start by, first why don't we um, filter our history to show us only the FASTQ files, um, so not the other reference data. So at the top of your history um, panel on the right, there's a search bar um, and you can search for and filter for um, your history. So if we type FASTQ in the top there, we see that we found exactly 40 files as expected. So these are all our um, um, sample data. Now these are the ones we want to put into a, a single collection. So we're going to check this uh, check mark icon at the top of our history 
um, hover over it and it'll say operations on multiple data sets. So we click that, we select all, and then we say here for all selected, this button has different options, but we want to make a list of data set pairs because we have paired and data and we have multiple paired and samples. So we're going to make a list of data set pairs. Now Galaxy will try to automatically create these pairs for you, automatically detect which ones go together, which forward and reverse reads. Um, you see here that it's trying to look for underscore one, and underscore two. Now remember that for us it's not underscore one and underscore two, but it's underscore r1 and underscore r2. So we can either edit these two fields or um, Galaxy also has some default filters. So if we choose here on choose filters, we can tell it, okay, our files are distinguished with this underscore r1 and underscore r2 uh, notation. Now you see Galaxy uh, finds some pairs. Um, it's a little bit hard to see with these long file names, but let's just auto pair. And then we can see here, it'll take these two files, pair them together and call them F3D0. So that all looks okay. And you see it does this, uh, made 20 pairs this way, so everything got paired. And then all that's left to do is scroll down to the bottom and enter a name. So we can just say um, maps samples. Again, you can name this whatever you want, it's not important. The most important thing here is that you know what is uh, in your collection. And then we hit create list. Now we're back at our history, so um, let's click on this check mark box at the top again to go out of selection mode. Um, let's also clear our history filter here at the top, so we're still only showing FASTQ files, but let's show everything so we can hit the uh, X button here. And now we see our um, collection with mouse samples. And it looks like one data set in, uh, in Galaxy history now, but if you click on it, you see that it actually contains 20 pairs, and each of these pairs in turn uh, contains two files, one forward FASTQ file and one reverse FASTQ file. So now we can take this, um, this entire collection and one, run it through a tool, and that tool will run um, uh, 40 times or 20 times, depending on um, what the tool does, um, with only one click. So this saves us a lot of clicking these collections. Okay, great. And with that, we have all our data ready and organized in Galaxy, and we can start um, analysis with some FASTQ or some quality control, I mean. Okay, so the first step of our quality control process will be to create contigs from our paired end reads. So in our case, um, we have sequenced the V4 region of the 16S uh, or RNA gene. We know that this region is approximately 253 uh, base pairs long. And the sequencing that we did was about 250 base pairs long. So we're doing paired end sequencing. So um, one read was sequenced from um, the one side of this 253 base pair long region in one direction, and the other one was sequenced from the other side of this 253 region um, in the other direction. So as you can imagine, there will be a lot of overlap in the middle between these uh, forward and reverse genes in our case. Um, so we're going to find that overlap and use it to improve the uh, quality of our sequence. So here you can see an example of how this can improve um, the quality. So imagine you have this forward read and this reverse read. So and you look here, you take these two and you find the best overlap. So you see here that if you overlap them like this with um, two um, base pairs overhanging at each end, then you have a pretty good match in most places. There's only one mismatch, but that could easily be a sequencing error. So what we do here is we take, uh, if there's a match, obviously we say, okay, the consensus sequence here is, uh, is an A, same for C. Because they both agreed, we can also um, improve our, uh, oops, 
our um, quality score here. So let's say this A had a quality score of 10 and this had 20. Now that we know that both of these agree on that position, uh, we can be more confident that it's actually an A. So we can increase this um, quality threshold. Same here. Now, if there is a mismatch, of course, uh, we will take the one which has the higher quality of the two. So here, the one read thinks it's an A in this position, and the other read thinks it's a T. Um, there's a higher confidence score of this T. So our consensus sequence, we're gonna take this T, but we're also gonna lower our confidence a little bit because of the mismatch in the other read. And of course, in the uh, few bases at the ends that don't overlap, we just copy straight to the consensus sequence. So we call this consensus sequence a contig, and that will be the first step we do. And in Mother, there is a tool called make.context to do this. So let's get back to our galaxy and search in the toolbar for make.context. Click on that tool. I'll drag these over a little bit. So here, first it'll ask us how we want to provide our uh, forward and reverse FASTQ files. So if you have only one sample, you can just give two separate files. But we have multiple samples, so we're going to say we have multiple pairs and that we have them in the collection. And then we only have one collection in our history, so it'll auto detect that one. And the rest will all leave to the default. Um, parameters and we just hit execute at the bottom. So what this will do is it will, for each of the sample, it'll take the forward reads and the reverse read, find the optimal uh, overlap and generate a consensus sequence of contig with a little bit improved uh, quality. Now what this tool also does is, is it uh, takes all these, um, these consensus sequences and it puts it in one big file. Um, so in the manual, while we wait for the results, we can already uh, have a look at what the output will look like. Um, so it'll give one big FASTA file with all the sequences. And then in order to remember which sample each sequence came from, we also have gets from these, this tool something called a group file. And this is a very simple file format which just has as the first column the read name uh, and then the second column which uh, sample it came from. So these ones came from um, female 3 day 0 and there will be some at the bottom that are from a different day. So this is all to make uh, things a little bit si uh, simpler in Mother. Um, so we now have, we'll have one big FASTA file with all our sequences and one group file. And we just need to provide both of these together to the subsequent tools to keep them up to date. Okay, so while we wait for um, a context to finish here, um, we can have a sneak peek at the next steps. So after uh, we have these contexts, we will do um, some data cleaning. So so we will filter by length. Um, so we know that um, our targeted region, the V4 region, is about 250 base pairs long, 253. Um, so if we have our two reads and the contig, and there wasn't a good overlap, that probably means there are something went wrong with sequencing. So if something is more than 275 base pairs long, um, then we're going to uh, remove it. We're also going to remove lots of low quality contigs. So if the consensus uh, quality is below a certain threshold, probably means there were lots of mismatches or there was a low quality confidence uh, score to begin with. And we are going to, um, to take those out as well. And lastly, because we are sequencing a microbiome we, uh, in a highly targeted um, area of the, the genome at that, um, we're going to deduplicate sequence. So we'll have many identical sequences likely. And for downstream analysis, it doesn't matter. It's a waste of 
computation if we take the exact same sequence and try to map it to the exact same reference genome. It's better to just take every unique sequence once and just remember in a separate file somewhere how many times this uh, unique sequence was encountered. So we will do that with um, this unique.seq tool. Now we see that now our May context has finished in the meantime. So I'll just give you a quick look at that. So you can use the eye icon to look in different files. So you see it's made a bunch of files here. So the first one is um, trim context.fasta. So these are the trimmed sequences. We see here this is a FASTA A format. So we have just the file name or the read name, I'm sorry, and the sequence. So no longer the quality information like the FASTQ file. Um, mother stores the qualities in a separate file. So you see here the trim context.qual. So they like to keep that separate. So here you see again the read names and then you see a list of quality scores here, the FRED scores. Uh, now the other um, thing it makes is the uh, scrap context. Anything that uh, couldn't find any overlap between will be in here. For us it's zero lines, so that means that um, we have pretty pretty okay data. But normally you can see here anything that did was not able to form a context. Um, there's also a, a short report here just to show you exactly where the overlaps are and how much overhang on each end, in case that's useful. And here is a group file that I mentioned, so this one is important. So this tells us uh, for every read name, so you see here this you saw in the FASTA file and, and the quality file as well, which sample it came from. So we have um, a lot of F3D0, and if we scroll down long enough, we'll find um, here some uh, read names from different samples. So the FASTA file and the group file is what we will um, give to other tools to, to do their analysis on. So to do the data cleaning step, go back to the tutorial. And like I said, in this short version of the tutorial, um, we are going to run these three steps um, as a workflow, just to save you a little bit of clicking. So you can find the workflow uh, is linked here in the hands-on box. So if you copy the URL, for example, right click it and copy link location, or you can just uh, click on it to download it to your computer and then re-upload it to Galaxy, but I'm going to use the URL. So I've got the URL um, copied, so um, the description of what to do next is also here in this box, but I will show you. So go to Galaxy, and go to workflows at the top here. And you see I have a lot of workflows already. Uh, you might not have any yet, that's fine. There are two uh, buttons there at the top, so if you want to create one from scratch, you can use this uh, create button, but we're going to import it. So we're going to click the import button, and then we can give it a URL. So just put in the um, URL you copied, it should end um, Galaxy uh, workflow files always end in .ga um, uh, or .yaml nowadays, but it should look something like this. And then we just hit import workflow. And as you see it uh, at the top of your list, workflow one quality control for the Galaxy training system S analysis with mother. Cool. So, um, if you click on the name of a workflow, you can get uh, some more information to view all the steps. You can rename it to something um, you remember a little bit better. You can make your own copy so that you can make changes if you want. And if you hit edit, you will see um, exactly what this um, workflow does in sort of a step-by-step -step way. So you see it'll take the context, the FASTA file and the group file and um, for a, no, a number of tools. So uh, screen.seeks will do the screening, it'll do the filtering and trimming. Uh, Unique.seeks is a de, uh, duplication we talked about. And summary.seeks is a tool that gives us some summary information about our data set. So it doesn't do anything, it just reports on our data set. But let's go back 
So you can either hit the play button at the top right here to, to run your workflow. Or if you are in the workflow menu, instead of clicking on the name, if you go to the right here, there's also this play button to run the workflow. So this is what we're going to do. So you can always choose when you run a workflow to send the results to a new history or not. Um, I'm going to keep it in my uh, current history, but this is really up to you. So you see that this workflow uh, requires two input files. It wants the contigs. So this will be the output of make contigs. Make sure you select uh, trim.contigs, not scrap, because scrap is what we throw away and trim is what we keep. So uh, make contigs, trim contigs on FASTA. For the group file, uh, make sure it's the uh, group file that was output by make.contigs. You can scroll down to see a little bit of the other settings and the tools that will be run, but we'll leave all of that to the default values and just run the workflow. So and you can see here, it'll, um, you can see a little bit about the workflow implication. So there are seven steps here that were scheduled and uh, none of them are complete yet. So we just have to uh, wait our return. So um, if things stay gray a lot, that usually means that it's a little bit busy on the server. Um, that's fine if there's a lot of people using Galaxy at the same time, you might have to wait a little bit longer than other times. Um, just to come back later or continue going because in Galaxy you can always already schedule the next step even if the previous one is not finished yet. Okay, so you see my jobs are getting scheduled now. So we will give that a minute to run. And I will already show you a little bit about what the output files will look like, the file formats, uh, while we wait in Galaxy. Okay. Um, so like I said, um, it will The screening step, um, it will do some, some filtering and cleaning and it'll remove some low quality reads. So uh, one of the questions uh, I would like you to try and answer when your uh, data is ready is how many sequences were removed in the screening step and how many uh, unique sequences uh, do we end up with in our clean data set? And now because of this, um, this a uh, unique tool. We have to remember uh, a third thing now. So we already have the FASTA file. We have a separate file to remember um, what, sorry, which um, sample each of our reads came from. And now we also have to remember each of our unique sequences. How many um, total sequences does that represent? Um, so we can. Um, save both those or capture both those things in a count table and this is will be output by the uh, unique.seqs tool and this count table will look something like this so for every unique sequence there will be a line the representative sequence it's called and here we can see this will be a big table we'll see that in total across all samples the sequence represented by this uh, sequence was observed 4400 times 370 times in sample F3D0, 29 times in, in sample F3D1, and so on. So now we have um, both that information, like what sample did these read come from and how many times was this unique sample observed in our count table. So from here on out, we will have our FASTA file and our count table that we provide to downstream tools that have all the information. So I will show you the output of summary.seeks uh, soon. This will give um, information about our current data set and it'll show us both how many of the unique uh, samples we have and how many and the total sequence represent. So let's check, it's still running. So uh, okay, we can see the first summary.seeks before cleaning. 
So we do a summary um, before the cleaning step and a summary after so we can see how well this worked. Let's just have a look at this uh, output now. So you see here it starts with just some general information about the tool and the version. Um, but if you scroll down a little bit, and this table is what we want to see. So it gives us a little bit of information about, um, so we can see here um, the length of each of the, um, all the reads. So you can see most of them are about as long as we were expecting. So we know that our region is 253 approximately. Um, so we see that 97.5% um, are uh, 253 or smaller uh, in length. There is, the longest one we have is 502 in length. So this is very likely a pair that had almost no overlap. Um, so that's why it's um, only a few basis overlap. So that's why it's so long. So we don't really trust this data because there should be a lot of overlap. So this probably something went wrong in the sequencing step. So uh, in our data cleaning, we want to remove um, reads like this. But we also see from this that it's um, less than two and a half percent that are this long. Uh, and on the lower end, we see that the, the smallest uh, one is 248 um, base pairs long. So that is a pretty good two that could easily be a, a deletion, um, a real deletion in the sequence. It gives us a little bit of information here. Ambigs stand for ambiguous bases. So uh, the number of calls that are very low quality um, that we're not sure about. So we see that again, the highest one um, is 249. So this is the one that did not overlap well. So that we are very unsure about all the bases. Um, and here the 97 percentile has six. So we probably want to filter out some of these um, these higher scores. Uh, we can see the total number of sequences. So we have 152,360 um, total sequences. And yeah, you can see how many are each, in each percentile. And here the last column is the polymer. So this is a uh, homopolymer stretches. So how many times the same base is observed in a row? So a lot of times sequencers are known to be bad at homopolymer stretches. So they, um, it's hard for them to distinguish whether this was like eight A's in a row or seven or, or nine. Um, and we also know for our region that there shouldn't really be more than um, five or six um, of the same uh, base in a row. So if we have significantly more than that, uh, we should also filter it out. So um, screen.seq is the tool that does this filtering. So you see it's still running, but here we would have given it a um, threshold of zero. So any reads with any ambiguous spaces we throw out. We know that um, we won't throw out more than a two and a half percent here. Um, so we can be quite strict since our data looks quite good. Uh, you might want to set that to, to one to allow for some ambiguous bases, but uh, we're going to be strict. And we set the homopolymer stretch to eight. So um, some of the worst um, reads will be filtered out this way. Okay, perfect timing screens. Uh, dot six is just finished. Um, so here as output, we get again our FASTA file. We see that it has filtered it down to 128,872 sequences, down from 152. So the difference there is um, number of uh, reads we uh, removed. Uh, we can find which reads those were in the bat.agnos accession numbers file. Um, and if we look inside this file, we can see which reads were thrown out and what the reason was. So this read was thrown out because it had too many ambiguous spaces, more than zero. And this read was thrown out for two reasons. Both uh, had too many ambiguous spaces and it, um, it was too long. Um, so this is uh, always good to, to look at. You always want to make sure that you're not being too strict and you're not throwing away too much data. Um, so it's always good to, to check the number of data sets that are thrown away. 
Okay, so after that cleaning, we will do another summary.seek step. We'll wait a little bit for that to finish. And you see that it already um, has taken a unique uh, sequences. So it's taken all our cleaned FASTA um, reads and tried to look at how many duplicates there are. And uh, please try, see if you can um, find how many unique sequences there are and how many duplicates there were. And it's pretty easy to answer in this case. You click on unique.seeks, you see uh, the number of sequences, so 16,426. Uh, we can see that we started with a, um, 128,000, so the vast majority here are duplicate sequences. But this is expected since we're sequencing uh, a lot of the same organisms are present and they will have the same um, 16 SB4 region. So this is not unexpected for this type of data. So let's quickly look at the summary after cleaning. So if you look at the eye icon here, I scroll down again. We see here now that it looks better. So um, our maximum is no longer 500, but 270, which is exactly the limit we set. Um, all our data has zero ambiguous spaces. Um, and one, um, yeah, and the total number now is 128,872. Uh, and then the final step we did was to create this count, count table using count.seq tool. And here uh, is all the information about um, this read uh, represents 440, for, uh, 4,402 total sequences. And you can see the number of times this exact sequence occurs in each of the samples. So this count table uh, we will um, provide together with the FASTA file and downstream analysis. Okay, uh, next step is to take these cleaned sequences and we will um, align them to our reference. So you should have seen some uh, more general information about sequence alignment or mapping in earlier tutorials. Um, there's a link to the training materials here if you have not yet. Um, this step isn't always done, so sometimes uh, the clustering into OTUs is done without alignment step first, but the creators of the mother tool um, have shown this improves the clustering if you do alignment uh, to the reference uh, first. So uh, that's what we will do. So there's a tool in mother called align.seeks to do this. So please, again, at the top of the tool panel, search for align.seeks. And here we have to provide it with um, our set of unique sequences. So the uh, FASTA output from unique.seeks. We have to give it our um, reference database. So we use the silver reference database. Um, we uh, have to select here that we want, that we have this file in our history. So the cache references are ones that are pre-configured by the uh, administrator of your Galaxy server. And if uh, you want to provide your own, you can select this to your history. And now we're going to scroll down to one of the files we imported at the beginning. And it should be silva v4.fasta at the end here. So we're going to take that as our reference genome or our reference uh, file. And we will leave everything else to their defaults and hit execute. Now what this will do it, is it will try to, it'll take each read and try to align it to the best place in the uh, reference, um, in the reference, the silver reference. Um, so again, we can use this to do some cleaning because if our read, for example, does not map to the V4 region as expected, um, we, uh, this read is not very useful to us, so we'll throw it away. So after alignment, we can have a look at where all these things lined up. Um, and see how, how well these line. This might take a few minutes, so um, if you want to get a cup of tea or coffee, now is a good time. Uh, just pause the video and come back later. Okay, so that was pretty quick actually, so mine has finished.
Um, let's just have a quick look at the output files here. So we see we have two output files here. We have the aligned sequences. I'll show you quickly what that looks like. So for have again uh, all the read names and then below that we have uh, it looks like just a bunch of dots now but if you scroll to the right um, and you're a bit patient you will see that uh, so we have to get to the v4 region of the reference you will see that some of our reads will start to uh, show alignments So we will uh, use a tool in a later step to sort of cut off all these uh, unnecessary dots to make things a little bit easier. But here you see I've come to the region where reads have started to align. So here are the T lines at this position, then there's a gap in the AC. Uh, but of course this is a huge file with uh, 16,000 or so reads in it, so it's not very nice to look at. The align report contains a little bit more information here. So here you can see for each read. Um, how long it was and where it um, where it aligned and what the uh, score was. So search means it uh, mapped perf or 100 means it mapped perfectly. Uh, so this is the percentage. Um, and you can see also um, where uh, some more information about how and where uh, what settings that were used and where it mapped. Okay, but um, actually we can use summary.seeks again to get uh, a little bit nicer um, a summary report here. So let's do that next. So we're going to search again for uh, summary.seeks. This time we are going to give it um, the uh, align output from align.seeks. We're going to give it also the count table so that it can tell us not only um, the number of unique sequences, but also the total number of sequences these represent. So it can give a little bit more complete summary of your data if you provide the count file. Uh, and that's it. And that's, oh no, we say also we want to output the log file because this is where the table will actually be. So we hit execute. It shouldn't take too long to complete once uh, it's my turn on the server but I can already show you in the training materials uh, what the output will look like. So, uh, so you probably recognize this by now. <coughs> it has the um, quartiles, uh, the percentiles here again. This time it has also the place in the alignment where it um, lined up. So we know that uh, um, in our reference, the V4 region um, goes from 1900 to uh, 11500. So anything that um, aligns here is expected, and anything that aligns very far away is probably an error. So, like this, the, the earliest alignment starts at 1250. So, this is probably um, wrong. And so, we're going to throw this away. And similarly, um, the maximum is uh, 1982. It's probably also wrong, but we see that the bulk of our data aligns exactly where we expected, so we can just throw out the outliers. And now, since we provided it both with our FASTA file and the count table, uh, we can see that um, all this represents 16,000 unique sequences, and those in turn represent 128,000 total sequences. And here this uh, last column also shows the total sequences, not just the unique ones. So that's why providing the count table here um, is nice because it gives you more accurate information. Okay, so our tool is finished now. i just quickly show you that it looks the same. But if we go to the log file output and scroll to the bottom, we see this uh, file that I just showed you from the training material. Uh, so that's good. Um, 
we can do after this a little bit more uh, cleaning. Like I said, we want to take out reads that don't align to the expected position. And um, just to make it a little bit easier, so you saw here, we have all these, um, oh, sorry, in the align file, we have all these dots everywhere. So we'll just cut um, columns out that for all reads have a, a, a dot in that position, just to make it a little bit easier. So that is done using filter.seeks tool. Uh, Screen.seeks that we used before for data cleaning, can also clean uh, alignments. So we'll use that. And then the final um, step we will do in this uh, section is pre-cluster. So we are going to look at all the uh, reads and very highly similar ones we are going to uh, merge together. So anything in uh, the region of sequencing error. So any two um, reads that have only one difference, uh, one base difference, that is likely um, sequencing uh, mistake, not a biological uh, difference. So pre.cluster, we're going to say um, any sequences that are so highly similar, we are going to treat them as one uh, unique one. And the last step will then be chimera removal. So I mentioned this in the slides, if you watch those. So uh, a thing that can happen during uh, PCR uh, here is that something goes wrong with, uh, with PCR amp amplification, um, whereby um, you get sort of two half sequences and these maybe um, form together a hybrid sequence. So chimera in Greek mythology is the name for a creature that consists of multiple creatures, so for example, uh, the head of a lion and the body of a uh, of, of a bird, uh, something like that. And in PCR, it's um, a sequence that is actually comes from two uh, separate sequences. So um, this can uh, affect your uh, downstream analysis, so we have to clean these out too. Um, yeah, so those are the steps that we'll we will do in our next workflow. So again, uh, well, same process, copy the link to this uh, workflow by right clicking, or you can click on it to download it and then re-upload it. I'm gonna copy this link location, go back to Galaxy, go to workflow at the top, uh, import button at the top, give it the URL, if you've downloaded the file, you will use not this top box, but the next one, and you can browse your computer for the file. Uh, make sure you give it the right thing. So again, this one ends in .ga and workflow to data cleaning. Then we'll just hit import. Let me see, we have workflow two here. Uh, let me have a quick look again to see what this workflow does. I can zoom out a little bit here at the bottom. Uh, takes the line sequences in the count table. It does a cleaning with screen.seeks. Uh, summary is always to get some information. It uh, does some filtering, so those alignment symbols it'll remove. Um, it'll do some pre-clustering, so a highly similar sequence, it'll cluster together. It'll look for uh, chimeras and remove uh, some uh, files. So to remove anything that um, was found to be um, clustered together. And then we do another summary way at the end of that. Okay, so let's run that. This time by hitting play again on the right, run workflow. And it should be pretty self-explanatory. We're going to send the results, we're going to keep them in this history. For the align sequences, make sure you give the uh, output from align.seeks and also the latest count table. Uh, we only have one. And we run. So I'm going to give this a minute to run. And then we'll come back. Finished. And if your um, analysis is 
uh, finish, see if you can answer these questions. So uh, try to look at how many chimeras uh, were detected and how many sequences remain after all these extrapolating steps. So remember we had about 16,000 something unique sequences before we went in. So just see how many um, this chimera filtering and this filtering on badly aligned sequences, um, how much we removed in those two steps. And I will come back with the answers in just as soon as my files are finished. Okay, so my jobs have now finished. So let us look at the outputs. So remember that we started with screen.seeks to remove any um, sequences that didn't align well. So let's go down to those. Okay, so we can find out here how many were removed and for what reasons. So if we go to the bad.acnos output um, of this tool, we can see that there are 128 lines here. So that means that 128 um, sequences were removed at this step because they didn't align at the expected location. So not over the V4 region. Uh, if we click the eye icon here, we can again see the read names and the reason. So uh, maybe the uh, ending um, alignment place was unexpected or the start uh, was, was too early or too late. Um, we also in the step filtered for homopolymer stretches so that we, we know that our V4 region does not have more than I think five um, homopolymers. A stretch of home polymers of five. So anything over eight we have um, filtered out here um, for extra cleaning. Then we did uh, the uh, filter.seq. So I will show you the output of this. Um, this just removed, made it a little bit more readable. It removed the uh, entire section at the beginning of the alignment that was just dots because um, that's the, the region before the V4 region. So this basically just cut out the V4 region for us. And then we again obtained our unique sequences. Uh, if we look here, we ha now have 16,000 unique sequences. <clears throat> and if we want to find out how many of these represent, we could do another summary.seqs. The next step was to do the pre-clustering. So we take all these sequences and try to identify uh, pairs that differ with uh, one or two bases at most. And we're going to assume that these are sequencing errors, not a biological difference. So we're gonna assume that these are the same and we're gonna generate a consensus sequence from those. Um, and we can see now if we expand this one, this was a major reduction step. So here we see that we ended up with 5,720 unique sequences <clears throat> down from 16,000 before. Okay, we can examine how many um, total sequences those 5,720 represent by clicking, uh, checking the summary.seqs. So if we check this output and scroll down to the bottom, we can see that those number of unique sequences in total represent 128,000 total sequences. The next step was to um, detect these hybrid sequences, these chimeras. You can see here how many there were if you click on the vsearch.acnos output of that tool. See that now we have 3,441 uh, unique sequences left after chimera detection. And if you would like to know how, um, how many that is, um, the remove.seq step actually removed those sequences. So the Chimera only does a detection Chimera tool and the remove.seq tools removes the, uh, the found Chimeras. So look at the latest summary that dot seeks that's labeled after Chimera removal to see how many total sequences were Chimeric. So we see that now instead of the 128,000 we had before, the total sequences are now 118,091. Okay, so now our data is optimally clean. Uh, now we can move on to uh, 
probably the more exciting part of this tutorial, we can go classify our, our sequences. Okay, for taxonomic classifications, there are a number of different approaches you can use here. I'm going to start the workflow first and then I will explain a little bit about uh, each of the steps. So we're going to import the workflow again. We're going to scroll down to the section removal of non-bacterial sequences. Um, copy the workflow URL. Go back to your galaxy. Click workflows at the top. Import. Paste the URL. And hit the import button. It should appear at the top of your list and we're going to run. It'll ask us for four uh, input data sets. So we want the latest um, FASTA and count table. These are from the remove.seeks tool. And for the classification, we're going to give it um, the reference data. So this is from the RDP. We're going to give it uh, reference taxonomy and reference uh, FASTA file. So the taxonomy should be the only option you see. And for the fourth one, we're going to move a uh, scroll all the way back and we're going to find the one that ends in pds.fasta, train set nine underscore some numbers pds fasta and run workflow. Okay, while that is running, uh, let's see uh, what these steps are actually doing. So like I said, taxonomic classification, there are several approaches you can use here. There are different tools uh, you can use. There are different reference uh, databases you can use. Uh, in this tutorial, we will use a Bayesian classifier via the classify.seeks tool from Mother. And Mother also provides a, uh, a training set based on the RDP. Um, project. So this is a ribosomal database project and we'll use that as a reference taxonomy. If you would like to read a little bit more about different methods of taxonomic classification and their effect, um, this background box has a couple links to some nice papers. So here you see an overview of a couple of different approaches uh, that all lead to taxon uh, taxonomy assignments and four popular reference databases. <clears throat> One thing I just want to highlight is that the choice, uh, choices you make here, as with every tool, they affect your outcome, your results. So this paper also did a nice comparison of different methods. So each of these panels here is a different method. Each, um, each graph is a different data set. And here on the x-axis uh, are different regions that were sequenced, different, uh, let's say different V4, uh, V regions. And you can see here that the different choices you make um, can affect your results. For example, um, in this mouse gut data set, if you use green genes here, um, you see that um, you identify mainly two different taxonomies. So this is relative abundance. But if you use here a different approach, you see you'll find uh, much more richness. And in the same way, depending on which um, region you use, even within one method, you will find different results. Um, so if you use this region here, you see you get a lot of this purple acidobacteria, but if you use this different region, you don't identify those. This is just all to say that these choices matter and you should understand uh, your sample and um, depending on your type of sample, uh, the question you want to ask, um, different approaches may be better for you. Um, <clears throat> so depending on the region you sequenced also. Um, so there's a nice discussion about this also in this paper linked here. Okay, so after we do the classification, uh, we might still have some non-bacterial sequences identified. So there might still be um, some 18S fragment, gene fragments in there. There might still be some uh, 16S fragments from archaea or chloroplasts or mitochondria uh, material might have survived. And these can now be uh, identified after this classification step. 
So we will also remove those. Okay, mine is still waiting to be run, so I'm just waiting my turn. But after that is done, we will look at the results. And when yours is done, see if you can answer this question. How many non-bacterial sequences uh, did we remove, did survived all our previous cleaning steps? So see if you can find both the number of unique sequences and the total number of sequences those represent that were removed because they were determined not to be bacterial in origin. So now that my tools have finished, let's look at the outputs. So we did ran the classifier. If we look at the taxonomy output, we see here that uh, each of the reads has now received a classification. So it's been determined that this is kingdom bacteria, um, phylum bacteroides, and etc. down to the uh, genus level. And you see the number here in, uh, in brackets is a confidence score. So yeah, and this is done for every um, every unique sequence. So now we have a taxonomy assigned to each of our reads. Now based on this, we might find some non-bacterial species. And for our analysis, we're not interested in these. So we're going to remove them. And we did this with uh, the remove.lineage tool. And uh, one of the questions in the tutorial was how many did we remove here? Um, so to answer this, um, you can look at the summary.seeks uh, output again before and after. So one nice feature um, of Galaxy, you may have used this already, maybe not, is this scratch book. So at the top here, you see this sort of grid icon. If you click that, you can open multiple files side by side to compare them. And we would like to do that now with the uh, summary.seeks before and after this, um, this classification and removal of non-bacterial sequence. So we're gonna click on that and then open the two summary.seeks outputs. So we're going to scroll down to the one before, which is labeled after a chimera removal. Press the eye icon, so now we see we get a little window on top of Galaxy here, which we can move and resize as well, or should be able to. Uh, yeah, with this, we're going to scroll down to the interesting part here, and then we're also going to click on um, the latest summary.seeks output. We're going to move those around a little bit to be next to each other so we can easily uh, compare. So I know on the left uh, on the left have the new output and on the right the old one. You see that before this step <clears throat> we had uh, 2,279 unique sequences representing 118,000 total and after this step we have 2,259 unique sequences so 20 unique sequences uh, were removed representing a um, hundred something um, total sequences. So that is how you can easily compare two files to find the answers. Okay, the next step in the training manual is to calculate error rates based on a mock community. Um, I will skip this for today, but it's quite interesting if you have the time to look at this. Uh, but I will explain what this section does. So a lot of the time when people sequence these types of samples, they will also co-sequence a mock community. So this is an artificially made uh, sample with uh, known quantities of known bacterial species. And if you sequence this and analyze this in the same way as your samples, you can use this to get sort of an estimate of how uh, well your methods work. Um, so there is a nice paper linked here that explains this a little bit. Um, so here you see on the left, they had, um, I think it's something like 20 different mock sample with 20 different species at uh, equal uh, proportions. So in an ideal world, you would like to find this exactly back, all these species at the right proportions. Uh, but they found that depending on which region you use, um, these results can, can differ uh, a lot. 
So um, it's always very important to um, really think about uh, what about your sample and about your research question and find out which um, methods and uh, which regions are best to sequence for you because it does have an impact. Um, so in this tutorial, we also had a mock sequence like this um, in our data set. So um, if to um, estimate the and uh, the error rates in our method, we would then take this mock sample, um, we would compare it to the sequences we know should be in there, um, and we can see if if all of our, um, our reads map to that uh, set of sequences that we know should be in there, then we are very good. If there are a lot of them that don't match any of those, uh, then we know there might be some contamination from somewhere else. Um, in our case, um, this was pretty good. So then we uh, feel more confident about continuing analysis with our other samples as well. Um, but we will just skip right to um, OTU clustering for our uh, real samples. Um, so the next step, OTU clustering. So remember OTU stands for Operational Taxonomic Unit. And basically this is clustering of similar sequences to a certain threshold. So we are gonna cluster sequences that are 97% uh, identical. Um, and this is sort of the variation you expect um, for different organisms from the same genus. So genus level similarity. Um, so as I've said before with 16S, um, this is usually the best solution you can get. And um, many of these tools will uh, give you inf go down to species level, but um, really you can only trust these uh, results usually to, down to genus level. And then you can make nice overviews like this and say how many, uh, which clusters uh, we have uh, in which taxonomy and at which proportions. So that's what this next workflow will do for us. Um, so again, import this workflow in the usual way, uh, copy the link, Let's go back to our Galaxy uh, workflow at the top. Import. Paste in the URL. Should be workflow 5, OTU clustering, and import. Okay, I'm going to start the workflow again, and then uh, we'll ex come back to explain what uh, what this workflow does. So here we see um, it wants three uh, different inputs. Um, so we're going to give it the latest ones. So I'm just going to make sure to give it the right one. So. Okay, so for the sequences, we're going to give it the latest one from remove lineage. Uh, count table, uh, the same one from the same tool, remove lineage. And for taxonomy, um, also the one we got from remove lineage. So that should be relatively simple and we run the workflow. Now we can have a quick look um, at the steps in this workflow. So if we go to the workflow menu, click on our workflow and edit, we can get that nice overview again of the different steps here. Um, so this first step removes, just removes the uh, mock sample from our uh, collection because we're only interested in our real samples. Um, and we are going to make the clusters, uh, classify each cluster and um, do some subsampling for the next step. Okay, and once this workflow has finished, we can examine the results again. So the most interesting results here are the outputs from the classify the OTU tool. So let's first look at the taxonomy output here. So you see this is a collection which contains um, a list of files. Um, here we could have um, indicated that we wanted to do this clustering at different similarity levels. Uh, we only chose to do the 97% uh, similarity, which um, here is notated in reverse as 0 0.03, but this means the 97% similarity threshold for the clustering. So 
if we look at this data, I'm just going to zoom out a little bit. We see that here we have a list of OTUs. So all our clusters are just given a number, OTU one through however many we found. Um, we see here how many reads were assigned to this cluster. So we see that this one's most prevalent. And then to see what that was classified as, uh, we see the next column. Um, so there were very many clusters here, um, 533 lines uh, in total. So minus the, the first line, the header line, that's 532 different clusters. Okay, the other output from this tool is a summary file. And again, if we look at that, um, I need to zoom out a little bit because this is a big file. And this one we can also see uh, for each of these uh, OTUs uh, that were classified, how, whether this was present in each of the samples. So here you can see the number of reads in each of the samples. So uh, the question in the training uh, manual is, can you find which samples contain Staphylococcus? So to answer that, you would, um, search for staphylococcus here. Okay, we see it's that line. And then we're just going to see um, for each, which samples have a non-zero number in that column. So a little bit more. Um, so this was our line. And we see that um, here the sample, uh, day 141, 142, 144, uh, they all contain um, this OTU and the others don't. Okay, so now that we have uh, done our clustering and assigned taxonomy to our different clusters, we wanna do some diversity analysis. So we want to say something about how diverse our samples are. Um, there is some nice description in the Emmanuel if you want to read some more about this. But broadly speaking, uh, diversity consists of um, a number of different concepts. So unfortunately, this isn't a physical um, um, thing that you can measure, uh, but there are different metrics um, devised by different people to describe um, diversity. So often this uh, comes down to one, you have species richness. So this is a measure of how many different species you have in your community. There is a species evenness. So how uh, similar in number are those uh, different species in your community? So is one maybe make, does one species make up 98% of your sample and the, the second one, the other 2%? Um, or is it more of a 50-50? Um, type relative abundance. So um, if one of them dominates, you would say it is less diverse than if these uh, species are more even in number. And then it also matters how closely related all those different species are. So if you have a community with maybe 10 different species, but these are all uh, from the same genus, you would say that is less diverse than if you have 10 different species, but they're all from vastly different uh, phylums, for example. So these three concepts, the number of species, um, the abundance of the species, and their uh, genetic relationships make up this concept of diversity. Um, but like I said, there are many different uh, ways to describe and measure um, diversity. So these are all names of different diversity metrics calculated in a different way to try and capture this. Um, and this is not even a complete list. Um, so just uh, for you to make sure you understand these concepts, try and think about this question in the, in the training material. So let's say we have community A here. Uh, which looks like this, and community B. Which one is more, has more richness and which one, uh, what can you say about the evenness? So take a minute to think about that um, and then we will uh, come back to the answers. So here the answer is the richness, remember, is the number of different species. So we can just count them here. We have in both of these, we have four. We have uh, yellow, red, brown, and purple. 
Um, so actually the richness here is the same. But the difference comes in evenness because here we see that um, in community A the yellow mushrooms really dominate and the other ones only have a few and here it's more evenly distributed. So typically we would say this community B is more diverse because of this um, difference in uh, evenness. But even if we had two communities with similar richness and similar evenness, also the uh, genetic relationship between them, um, like I said, um, might play a factor in what we um, label as more diverse than another. So for example here, this shows, this is a phylogenetic tree, so things closely related on this tree are genetically similar. So let's say if you look at blue, um, it has these uh, three, four, six, um, different species in it, but they are all in the same uh, same tree here, while this red one is more diverse because it has some in this top half of the tree and also samples in the uh, our species in the bottom half. So we would say um, that red is more diverse because it is more genetically diverse. Okay, so there are two broadly speaking two types of uh, diversity. So there's alpha diversity, which speaks about the diversity within one sample, one community, like we have been doing before. Um, and then there's beta diversity, which um, says something about comparing different communities to each other. Um, so one way that we can um, estimate alpha diversity um, something that is helpful here is to make rarefaction curves. Um, so basically here we want to, uh, we plot the number of OTUs um, compared to how much data we use. So we want to, uh, we subsample the data and say what if I only use 10% of my data, how many OTUs did I find? What if I only use 50%, how many uh, OTUs would I have found? All the way up to 100. And what we would like to see is a curve such as this green one, which indicates that um, even uh, that levels off in the end here, which would indicate that even if we would sequence more, uh, we wouldn't necessarily find more OTUs. So that means we have captured the full, uh, the full richness of our community. If however we ever see a line more like this, um, where we see that it is not leveling off, that would indicate that had we sequenced more uh, deeper, um, then maybe we would have found more uh, more OTUs, more clusters, more species in our sample. So that means we have did not sample enough. So this is also a nice way to estimate whether you uh, your sequencing was good enough to capture the full diversity in your sample. And again, there's more reading suggested here if you would like to know more about these concepts. So we are going to make this plot for our own data as well uh, and do some alpha diversity. So this is what this next workflow is for. So again, we will uh, copy this link, go to our galaxy, import the workflow. Okay, and then we are going to run it. And all this asks for is um, a shared file. So this is one of the outputs that we made in our previous um, in our previous workflow. So this is uh, another uh, data set that, oh, let's have a quick look, it shows us um, for each of the samples um, and each of the different similarity levels um, how many reads were um, assigned to which OTU. This is a, a very big table. But this has all the information about the uh, the clustering in it is the important thing. So we're going to take this file and we're going to uh, give it to um, the alpha diversity workflow. 
and just hit run. Okay, and once these tools are finished, we will have a look at the output again. So first let's look at the output of summary.single. And here we see that uh, for each of these uh, samples, we have different diversity metrics. So um, SOBs, that's the number of observed sequences. Um, inverse Simpson is very popular uh, diversity metrics. Um, so these are the, um, yeah, the different measures, but uh, the other output that we generated uh, is a refraction plot that I mentioned. Uh, if you would like more information, by the way, about these different metrics and how they're calculated, there are links in the training material. And the refraction plot, let's see if we see this expected drop off. Uh, so here each line represents one of our samples. Um, on the y-axis is the number of OTUs we observe using different number of subsamples. So what this algorithm do did, it took our data set and it said, what if I only um, had 10% of the reads, how many OTUs would I have found? So it subsamples it down to 10% and then calculates the number of OTUs and does this for different values um, down to like the total data we have. So we see here that for most of our samples, we see that it has started to drop off a little bit, but they're not exactly flat yet. So probably if we had sequenced a little bit deeper here, we would have discovered a few more OTUs. But at least the, the flattening off is happening. Okay. Um, the next step will then be to uh, compare different samples. So this was all about um, for sample metrics. And now we want to um, compare these different samples. So this mouse at different days and see um, how the, the diversity compares between those time points. So that is what the next uh, workflow will do. We will create some um, diagrams, some heat maps and um, trees and other outputs to sort of visualize diversity between samples. So let's start at first and we'll discuss the outputs. So again, here are pros at this now, copy this uh, workflow link and import it to your galaxy. Okay, and then let's run it. Okay, I'll ask for two inputs. shared file, so this is only one option for me, and uh, the subsample shared, so we're going to here select um, the output, the shared output from subsample. Um, there was an error here before, but it changed now um, when I changed the, um, the file to the correct one. And that's it, let's hit run. Again, this will take a minute or two to complete but I can already show you the kinds of outputs we're going to get. So one of the outputs here will be a, um, a heat map and here you have um, each of the samples on the y-axis and again on the um, x-axis and the, um, the brighter the, the red, the more similar they are. So we see here that um, this sample, which is, uh, you have to zoom in to read that. Um, uh, day four is very different than, than the other ones here, um, than the late time samples. So we can see this in the high resolution in Galaxy itself later. And did this for different calculators or different diversity metrics. So for beta diversity, again, it's similar to alpha diversity. There are a lot of different um, metrics here that were defined by different uh, researchers and groups of scientists and that are used. And depending on which, which one of those you use, you'll get slightly different results. Another thing we will uh, have done in this workflow is we wanted to see sort of the similarity um, between samples. So we made a Venn diagram. So obviously this doesn't work for a large number of samples, but we did it for four of them. So if you have a small number of samples you want to compare, um, you can use this Venn 
diagram. So you see here that 67 uh, OT or sorry, 76 OTUs were present in all four of them, all four samples, and there were quite a few in each that were unique to that sample. So this can also give you a little bit of a feeling for how similar these different different samples were. <clears throat> and then we have also a tree view. So this is a phylogenetic tree, which also indicates how closely related um, samples are on average, uh, genetically speaking. So here I tried to cluster them on, um, on similarity. So you see here that this whole group, so these are actually all the early time points, is clearly different from the um, all the later time points, except day zero, which is perhaps a bit odd, but you can see that these all um, are quite close together, and these as well. So that is approximately what we would expect to see too. Okay, let's see if uh, Galaxy is already ready. Okay, we're gonna wait a little bit longer. Um, so those are the two main types of diversity, alpha diversity, looking at within one sample and beta diversity across samples. And there are many metrics here you can use, um, but they all measure this, try to capture the same, the same thing, diversity of the sample. Okay, so you see the Galaxy also nicely gives you sort of a progress bar. So if you have jobs that generate a list, you can see here that this one is halfway done. And if you look at it too, you can see already um, some are done, some two are still working, and one is queued. And the ones that are done, you can already have a look at. So here is, uh, are the Venn diagrams that I mentioned before. So I'll just zoom in a little bit here. So now you can read the tags better. You see here that day one is very different from, from the high days here. Um, so these are nice output, outputs to, to examine for your samples. Just gonna wait till this is done, and then you can see the other outputs. But we already um, discussed them uh, in the in the tutorial. I'm just gonna move on to the next step, uh, which is going to be also the last step, and we're gonna do some more um, visualization here. So one really nice tool to do visualizations is Krona. So I already put the output also um, in the manual here. But you can see that what you end up with Krona is an interactive plot to explore your sample. So these are all the different uh, OTUs and classifications that we found uh, in our sample. And here, if we want to look more closely at the, the Formicutes, uh, you can double click those uh, and you see that this pie chart changes and you can zoom in here on specific um, things that you're interested in. And then you can see, um, and you can go back up by clicking in the middle. So this is a really nice tool to sort of explore your sample and the community structure. So here we see 16% of these were lactobacillus. If we can go back up to uh, all, so all bacteria, 100%, 5% uh, of those were this. Um, so this is a really nice tool. So let's make this this, um, this plot ourselves. Okay. So we're just gonna run uh, the tools, not a workflow this time. So first we are going to prepare our um, taxonomy file to be a compatible format for Krona. So we made a special tool for that called taxonomy to Krona. So type that in the search bar and it'll pop up here, convert a mother taxonomy file to Krona input format. So this um, just rearranges the, the format of the data, the columns a little bit to what Krona expects. So let's run taxonomy to Krona. So for the taxonomy file, we are going to give it the output from classify.otu, but um, this was a collection. Um, so we're gonna click here on uh, this rightmost button in the folder. 
so that we have this option or the taxonomy output from classify.otu. And that's it. So this will just do some transformation of that file so that afterwards we can run the Krona tool here by choosing Krona and the Krona pie chart is the one we want. And then we can tell it that we have a tabular data set. This is what the previous tool is making and we're going to give it the output here of taxonomy to Krona as soon as it's finished. Uh, so we see that this is also a uh, collection with one element in it. So we're going to again choose collection and taxonomy to Krona. And execute. I can just have a quick look at uh, what we gave to Krona, what that looks like. So this is a very simple table that just tells us the number and then this is the entire uh, hierarchy kingdom phylum all the way down to um, species or genus. Uh, it's a pretty simple file and because Krona does not care what the data is, it can visualize any hierarchical data. Okay, so when this is finished for you as well, try to um, have a look, play around with Krona, try to see what percentage of your sample was labeled uh, lactobacillus. Uh, and the answer, the solution is here in this box. Now this um, Krona chart um, is one that shows it for all your samples together. Uh, if you want to get individual level um, or plots per sample. Um, there's also a section in the um, in the training materials to do this uh, as an exercise for you. So this is really a nice sort of final output where you can explore the, the structure of your your tutorial of your sample, I'm sorry. So another nice visualization tool is Finch. So this is a tool outside of Galaxy, but we can access it or open it from within Galaxy. Um, and this will let us um, explore sort of the, um, the or compare different samples uh, in our browser. So that's very nice. Um, to do that, we have to first make a biome uh, file. So this is a uh, kind of a standard file format um, across different metagenomics analysis tools. So we're going to use the tool make.biome to convert from the mother format file formats to this more standardized format. So here it'll ask us for a shared file. Um, so we're going to give it just our latest one. Um, taxonomy. Um, we're going to give it again, it's a collection, but from uh, classify.otu and it wants some metadata. So this is another thing we uploaded in the very start. So we're going to scroll all the way, all the way down to the bottom and find um, a file. Let's see, it's called metadata. It's got metadata in the name. So go past all our SKU files here, mouse.dpw.metadata and execute. So we're going to get that a minute to finish. OK, 
Okay, and once our um, make.biome file uh, tool is ready, let's click on that. It's a little bit of a nesting of the files, but eventually you'll get there. And now we don't click the eye icon, we can, but then we just see that this is um, this text format. To do the visualization in Finch, um, if you're on the EU server, um, you uh, see this link that you can just click on. Uh, if you're working somewhere else or you don't see this link, you can also download this file and upload it to the main Finch server yourself. Um, and there's a little description here of how to, uh, how to do that. Uh, but for me, I'm just going to click here. Um, you see that um, it's now being loaded into Finch. I can view my data. I see here my samples and the sequence reads. So they're all the same because we subsampled it to the same uh, level earlier. Um, so as a sort of normalization to do this comparison. And then we can go proceed to gallery to view our, um, our generated plots. So here I just explore this add your own leisure a bit. Um, there's a bubble chart that shows you um, the different uh, species available. Let's go to these donut partitions. They're nice. Uh, oh, not available for this. Let's go back. Um, just go to taxonomy bar chart. So here we see um, for each of the samples, we see here um, the composition of our sample um, and the top 10 sequences. Um, there's a lot to explore here, so we can go to different taxonomic levels here to view. So we started out in the phylum level, so most of this are um, these two um, phylums of bacteria. Um, if we go all the way to kingdom, we see that 100% is bacteria because we um, selected for that, of course, we moved everything else. And if we go down to genus, you see here uh, the, the, the different composition tables. And yeah, so just explore this a little bit. This is a nice tool um, for comparing your different samples. Um, if you have any questions about this, feel free to ask uh, in chat. Um, and this is the end of our tutorial. So just a recap of what we did today. Um, so we started by um, uploading our data, of course. We did a lot of quality control. Um, based on the, the length, uh, based on the quality. Um, then we did an alignment and it's more cleaning after that. We removed anything that wasn't bacteria because we're not interested in those. Um, we can assess the error rate based on our mock community. So I skipped this, but you can go back and you can do this if you're interested. Uh, then we clustered our data into OTUs. We classified these and then we analyze these different clusters for alpha and beta diversity, and then we visualize with Finch and Krona. So the key takeaways of this tutorial are that um, 16S rRNA sequencing um, is very nice for taxonomic profiling. It is relatively cheap and it's well established. Um, there are many tools and algorithms out there um, and reference databases. Just be aware that your choice of algorithm uh, and reference database may bias your results. Um, as with any analysis, quality control is a crucial step to getting good results. So um, that's why we spent a lot of time in this tutorial doing that also. The mock community can serve as a control for your, for your experiment and helps you assess the error rate. And Finch and Krona are two very great um, visualization tools for exploring your final results. If you want to do more reading, there are some references listed below here. And as always, if you have any feedback about this tutorial, um, please uh, fill in this form here. So this is really about these materials. Um, any other feedback about this video, about this week's course, you can do it in Slack. Um, yeah, so thank you all for joining and ask us all your questions in Slack.